All right, today we are doing lesson 3.3, function notation. Just by a show of hands, does anyone uh, recognize the word function notation? All right, good. So in function notation, first things first, we gotta understand what that is, what it looks like. And so our essential question today is how can you use function notation to represent a function? Now, many review because it's a good thing to review before a new lesson. Also, we have a quiz tomorrow. All right, we learned last week the definition of a function. For every input, there is exactly how many outputs? Very good. So if I put one value into a function and only one number comes out, it is indeed a function. All right? Um, also, we learned last week about linear and nonlinear functions. If a function is linear, what does its graph look like on a coordinate plane? A line. The first four letters in the word linear is line. So hopefully that helps you to remember. What about a nonlinear function? It's a function, but it's nonlinear. What kinds of examples did we have of a nonlinear function? Uh, hold on, a circle wasn't a function though. A parabola, very good. I knew it was gonna come to somebody. All right, a parabola, that U-shaped graph that we saw last week, it's a function, but it didn't create a line, so it was a nonlinear function. All right, very good. Remember a circle, if we did the vertical line test, the vertical line hits a circle twice, so it's not a function. All right, but that's okay. We're thinking, and I'm good with that. Now, when you see a problem written with f of x, all right, and I basically just told you the first two things on this screen, okay, this is called function notation. You have the letter f, and then directly beside it in parentheses, you have an x. All right, this is called something being written in function notation. Now, how do you read that? You read it as f of x, okay, f of x. Number three, any letter can be where f is. I can have a g, I can have an h there, and you kind of saw that as you copied down your notes today, all right? As long as there is a letter and then directly followed by a set of parentheses with an x, okay, any letter can be there for f. Now, if you are a highlighter, here is the most important thing that I believe is on this screen. You need to understand that f of x is equivalent to the variable y. So, for example, when I gave you last week, we talked about y equals mx plus b. Does everybody remember this? Mm -hmm. This is called what form of a line? Line. The slope intercept form of a line. Very good. So, if I were to write this, as f of x equals mx plus b, I want you to understand that's the same thing, all right? That's how interchangeable y and f of x are. Whether I write y equals mx plus b or I write f of x equals mx plus b, f of x and y are interchangeable, okay? y and h of x are interchangeable. Is everybody with me? All right, so let's move on to example number one. It says evaluate. Now, this is not a word that we have uh, discussed a lot this year. It is a word, though, that you should know. Who remembers what it means when it says evaluate? Mm. A little mini review from pre-algebra. What does it mean to evaluate? They get to the right spot. Okay, I think I heard Deja say the right thing. To solve. All right, so add this note to your notes. All right, just as a reminder, because you see evaluate a lot in your instructions. You got to know evaluate simply means to solve. Now, evaluate the function for the given values of x equals negative 4, 0, and 3. Again, thinking back to next week, or last week, can't think back to next week. Think back to last week, what's another name for those values? If I've given you the x values to plug in, I've also given you the. Coordinate. Nope, starts with a D. Domain. domain. Very good. Remember, your x values are also your domain. Now, they want us to evaluate the function, and they've given us three values for x. So we are going to create, just to keep ourselves sane and organized, we're going to create a chart. Okay? Our first column is going to be those x values. So we have negative 4, 0, and 3. The next column is going to be our function. Now, let's go ahead and write y equals 2x minus 5. And then our last column is going to be our y value. All right, now why did I choose y equals 2x minus 5? Because I'm showing you that f of x equals 2x minus 5 is the exact same thing as 
y equals 2x minus 5. Okay? Now, what am I supposed to be doing with 2 and x in this problem? Multiplying. Multiplying. So, remember, when we plug values in, we plug them in in parentheses. So, 2 times negative 4 minus 5. I'm going to write it again, and this time 2 times 0 minus 5. And the third time, I'm plugging in 2 times 3 minus 5. So we're going to solve this function when we plug in negative 4, for when we plug in 0, and for when we plug in 3. Now, order of operations. Another mini review for you. Order of operations says I have to do what part of that problem first? Mm, I heard two different answers. What do I have to do first? I have to multiply, right? I have to multiply before I can add or subtract. So we're multiplying what's 2 times negative 4? Negative 8 minus 5? Negative 13. All right, what's 2 times 0? Zero? 0 times negative 5? 0 minus 5 is negative 5. And what's 2 times 3? 6. And 6 minus 5? One. one awesome so i have evaluated and we're just going to box in this whole table of information okay i evaluated the function when x equals negative four when x equals zero and when x equals three so my actual answer is negative 13 negative five and one but we're just going to go ahead and box in that whole chart all right let's do it again for b we've got x now this time i'm just going to leave g of x equals negative x minus one and of course my last column is going to be my y column we're using those same x values, negative 4, 1, and 3. I'm sorry, negative 4, 0, and 3. And I'm going to write the problem. g of x. Now be careful, okay? There's a negative in the function. It doesn't replace the negative with the 4. So it's the opposite of negative 4 minus 1 is how I would read that. Plug in the second time, the opposite of 0 minus 1. And the last time... I'm going to do the opposite of 3 minus 1. Okay. Now again, we have what stands out to you in this first function? Double the double negative. And a double me negative makes a positive. positive. So 4 minus 1? 3. three. three. There's no such thing as negative 0. So what's 0 minus 1? Negative 1. Good. And how do I read that last one, Dalton? Good. G of X equals negative 3 minus 1. So what's negative 3 minus 1? Negative 4. Negative 4. Good. And again, let's just box in that whole table because I can very clearly see what X values I plugged in, where I plugged them in, and what came out. All right. This is preparing us for graphing. So this is may seem like a lot of work, but this is actually preparing us for graphing here in a couple examples. All right. Example number two. It says... Find the value of x. Now, this is a mistake that I'm seeing made on a lot of tests. We're boxing in an answer that has nothing to do with what the instructions have asked us to do. So if I'm going to help you be the best math student you can be and really just a really great test taker, I'm going to teach you to make sure that your boxed in answer matches up with what the instructions have asked. So these instructions say, find the value of x. So it doesn't make any sense for me to say, oh, they've given me x. All right? They want me to find the value of x. So here's what I want you to do with letter A. Letter A says f of x is equal to 6x plus 9, and f of x equals 21. Now, what variable did we say f of x was equivalent to? So I want everybody to write down y equals 6x plus 9, and then I want you to write y equals 21. Okay? Because I want you to visually see, for whatever reason, a lot of students, when they see this right here, they try to tell me that x is equal to 21. And I'm supposed to go replace x with 21. But that's not the case. If f of x is equivalent to y, which variable have they actually given me the value of? Y. y. So I've got to go back to the left side of the equal sign and replace y with 21. So 21 equals 6x plus 9. Now, guys, I've been preaching this since day one. Algebra builds on algebra. Algebra concepts continue to come with us into new chapters. Here's a perfect example. We got to solve an equation. If you don't know how to solve an equation, you're probably lost at this point. Okay? So make sure you know how to solve an equation. 
Noah, what do I do first if I'm trying to get X by itself? Good, I'm gonna subtract nine from both sides. 21 minus nine is 12, and I bring down what I have not used. Trevin, how do I finish this problem? Wait, you said 12. Yeah, 21 minus nine is 12. Oh my gosh. All right, now how do I finish this? Josh, how do I finish it? You divide by six. I divide both sides by six, good. So X is equal to two. Now I'm gonna box that in, and then I'm gonna go check my directions. Did I do what my directions asked me to do? No. It said, find the value of X. Oh, yeah. So yes, here's what I don't understand. When people work a problem and, and box in Y equals two, and they move on. If I check, if I say Y equals two and I go back to the directions, hopefully I'm figuring out, wait a second, I did something wrong because they asked me to find the value of X. All right, so X is equal to two, we did it, awesome job. Now for B, leave it as it is. H of X is equal to two thirds X minus five and h of x equals negative seven. Drew, where am I plugging in the negative seven? Um, where the x is. Ah, be very careful. h of x is equal to negative seven. So I'm actually plugging in the negative seven where what is? On which side of the equal sign? The left. Right, h of x. They are giving me the value of h of x. So I, again, I'm going to the left side of the equal sign and I'm plugging in the negative seven. And then I'm bringing down the rest of the problem. All right. Timothy, how do I begin to solve for X? What do I do first? Good, I'm gonna add five to both sides. So negative seven plus five is negative two and it equals bring down what you have not used. Now, I gotta move a what, Anthony? Two thirds. And how do I move it to the other side? I'm going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal, which is three over two. Now be very careful. Even if you didn't have a calculator, you should be able to multiply. Okay. Negative two. If I wanted to make it a fraction, I would put it over one. Remember we're multiplying numerators and we're multiplying denominators. What is three times negative two? And negative six over, what's two times one? Okay, so negative six divided by two is negative three. So even without a calculator, we can multiply. All right, awesome job. Now, example number three. All you're gonna see in the book, on a quiz, on a test, is graph the linear function. So here are your three steps. Create an X and Y chart. Use x equals negative 1, 0, and 1 as your domain. Plot the points and draw a line. Now, I want you to pay really close attention. As a general rule, we are going to use x equals negative 1, 0, and 1. So we're going to do exactly what we just did back in example 1. Okay, And again, if you want to replace f of x with a y, you can. But we are going to create an x and y chart the exact same way we did back in example 1. Now, like I said, the instructions are simply going to say graph the linear function. So I'm teaching you when you see that, make your world simple. Use negative one, zero, and one. Here's why. You've got a negative number in there, you've got zero, and you've got a positive number. By doing a one, you're going to keep your graph small. Instead of graphing numbers that are up in the 20s and the 30s, by plugging in a negative one and a positive one, you're gonna keep your ordered pairs smaller, all right? So you've gotta remember when it just says graph the linear function, oh, this is where I make an X and Y chart and I use negative one, zero, and one. All right, so let's plug those values in. Y equals three times uh, negative one minus two, Y equals three times zero minus two, and y equals three times one minus two. So let's do the math. What's three times negative one? Negative three minus two. Good, three times zero? Zero minus two. Three times one and three minus two, one. Now, we have created three ordered pairs. Yasmin, what is my first ordered pair? Good, all I gotta do is look at my x column and my y columns and I have my ordered pairs. So negative one, five, negative five, right? Okay, negative, uh, negative one, negative five. All right, what's my second ordered pair? Michael. 
Zero, negative two. And Trevin, my last ordered pair. Good. Now, go to the graph. I got to plot my three points. So starting in the center of the graph, my first coordinate is negative one. So I go right or left? Class? Left. left. There's only one person answering me. Right. Left to negative one, and then my Y coordinate is negative five. Am I going up or down? Down. Good. Left to negative one, down to negative five. Zero, negative two. If my X value is zero, do I move right, left, or nowhere? Nowhere. nowhere. And my Y is negative two, so I go down. down to negative two. And then one, one, I go right one, up one. Now, here's another thing that blows my mind. We know we're graphing linear functions, yet people will get graphs that are not lines, and they'll move on. If I've got a point that's randomly out in the middle of nowhere, and my graph is not a line, I've got to go back to the drawing board. There's somewhere that I went wrong. So let me go figure out where I went wrong and fix it. Because my graph, it's a linear function. My graph is supposed to be a line. All right? Now, looking at letter B, remember I said as a general rule, we're going to use negative one, zero, and one. But there's always an exception to a rule. And again, you can use negative one, zero, and one. But what does this problem have in front of X? What is the slope of this line? It's a what kind of a number? Fraction. It's a fraction. And do any of you just love fractions and love working with fractions and love graphing fractions? No. no. So let me help you. I want to get rid of the fraction. So instead of using negative 1, 0, and 1, I'm going to go find the denominator. What's the denominator of your fraction? 4. Four. All right. So let's go ahead and get our, get our chart. We've got x equals negative three-fourths x minus one. And then of course our last column is gonna be our y column. Now, what did we say the denominator of our fraction was? Four. So let's try this. Let's use negative four, zero, and positive four. And let's see what happens. Now what if my denominator was two? What would I use? Negative two, zero, and two. Negative two, zero, and two. What if my denominator was five? Good. All right. So you get the idea. Find the denominator, use the negative of that number, zero, and the positive of that number. So let's plug it in. We have h of x is equal to negative three-fourths times negative four minus one. h of x is equal to negative three-fourths times negative, oops, sorry, zero minus one. And h of x is equal to negative three-fourths times four minus one. Now, a negative times a negative is a positive. So we know it's going to be positive. But what is 3 fourths times 4 going to give me? 3. 3. And what's 3 minus 1? 2. Two. Awesome. Negative 3 fourths times 0? Zero. 0 minus 1? Good. And negative 3 fourths times 4? Four. <coughs> negative 3, right? A negative times a positive is a negative. The 4 still cancel. So negative 3 minus 1 is? Good. What are my ordered pairs? Negative 4, 2, zero negative, zero, negative 1, four negative four. 4, negative 4. But do you see what happens? When I use the denominator as my x values, my, va my fractions go away. And my life is so much simpler. So negative 4, 2. I go left to negative 4. I go up to positive 2. I stay at 0. I go down to negative 1. And I go right to 4 and down to negative 4. Again, my, my dots should form a straight line. And the arrows on the end are a must. That lets me know that my graph keeps going in both directions. Again, if I have a random point, something is wrong. And I got to go back to the chart and I got to find my, find my mistake. All right, any questions? All right, lastly, and this might be the most difficult thing we do today, interpreting a function notation. Okay, it says let f of t be the outside temperature t hours after 9 a.m. Now, the f we recognize, they changed the x to a t, and that's okay, because they're telling us what, th what this stands for, all right? So look at letter a. Anytime they replace the parenthesis with a number, they're telling you the value of that variable. So what variable was originally in the parentheses? T. t. So they're telling me that t equals what? Four. What about in letter B? 
What are they telling me T equals in letter B? T equals N. Okay, awesome. Now, remember, yes, this says F of 4, but basically it's F of T. What does the entire function actually equal? 75. Good. The other side of the equal sign is 75. So what is F of T in letter B? 70. 70. Okay, everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. Whatever they re have replaced in the parentheses, they're telling me the value of the variable. So in this, these problems, T equals 4 and T equals M. The other side of the problem is telling me the entire function. F of T equals 75 and F of T equals 70. All right? Now, pay attention. F of T is the outside temperature T hours after 9 a.m. So if T is 4, what is 4 hours after 9 a.m.? 1 what? So at 1 p.m., what's the temperature? 75 degrees. Very good. At 1 p.m., the temp is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Because they told us up in the instruct up in the problem, it's Fahrenheit. Okay? So that's your answer. Now, it gets a little bit trickier, though, when you look at letter B and they don't put a value for T. They just give you a variable. So how would we word this? Okay, this one, this one got me at first too. All right, here's how you actually would write this. The temperature is 70 degrees M hours after 9 a.m. Okay, or you could say at M hours after 9 a.m. the temp is. So if you want to keep it like letter A, we can write at M hours after 9 a.m. the temp is, what was the temp? The temp is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so if they don't give you an actual variable, or I'm sorry, they don't give you an actual value, we're just going to fill it in. At M hours after 9 a.m., the temp is 70 degrees. All right, so number 12 in your homework looks like this, and there's a couple more, a couple more ways they have it written. So challenging, you use your brain. Do your very best. See if you can interpret it based off what I have just told you. Okay, that is lesson 3.3.